So I just want to welcome all of you here to the 58th installment of the TB Devi Memorial Lecture. Some of you may know the history of Thomas Benjamin Devi, and TB Devi was very much instrumental in fighting and mobilizing support against the entrenchment of the use of the university in terms of enacting state powers to subjugate the people in a way in which the idea of freedom and academic freedom was intertwined with freedom within the community as well as civic structure. And I think for me that's always been such an important uh, feature to appreciate where what is seen as academic freedom is not divorced from our social responsibility within our communities because the delineation between what TB Devi was standing against and what was a whole agenda for the whole country and are inseparable. And I think that's an important consideration when we come and deal with this. And he had the misfortune of, of dying relatively early. He was, he was six years old in 1955 when he unfortunately passed away. And four years later when this law was passed, that also then became an opportunity for this university to continue with the flagship of memorializing what was fighting against by this series of lectures which we are continuing with until today. So I want to welcome you to this time and with that in mind of seeing ourselves as we speak about academic freedom in the context of the whole and not some kind of an ivory tower of practice within university establishment but seeing it in its broadest um, uh, um, kind of view as well as the broadest kind of of responsibility to, to the whole of our country and the whole of the continent. So I am going to just ask the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town um, to come and make a few remarks before we proceed with the, with the program. Professor Mshavela. Good evening. It's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to also join the chair. Or oh, is it still acting chair? <laughs> the, the chair of the Academic Freedom Committee in welcoming you to, to this lecture. It is um, an important event, a flagship event, um, for the Academic Freedom Committee every year to be, to be hosting this lecture. And I, I want to thank the chair and all the members um, of the Academic Freedom Committee for ensuring that um, we have reached this point of uh, bringing um, our special guest who's going to address us um, this evening to the event. Um, and also just to thank you for coming all the way to, to, to join us. Um, I know you're going to be introduced properly uh, later, Judge, but um, we're very honored. Um, it's not often that we will have the privilege of um, listening to the judge of the ICJ um, in this platform, but uh, because um, one of our very sons of the soil is also a member of the august body, um, we're honored that you have agreed to join us and spend time with us. Um, let me also just greet um, all the colleagues, the students, the members of the executive that are here, all the deans, all the HODs, um, and all and everyone who's present, um, those who are uh, at UCT and those who are interested um, in this talk. And uh, to also just um, reiterate what uh, Professor Ruzani has uh, indicated that this 58th TB Devi lecture 
comes at a critical point also for UCT. Um, as we memorialize what we know of in the history of this university um, from back in 1948 um, to the death of uh, Professor T.B. Davy in 1955. And uh, the foresight really um, of the then chancellor um, who essentially after having lost um, Professor Thomas Benjamin Davy decided um, to essentially arrange um, to commemorate the life of, of T.B. Davy. Um, <coughs> T.B. Davy, in the time that the National Party was engaging in the legislation that was going to limit admission of black people to South Africa's universities, mainly white universities, declared a principle of academic freedom that is intended to uphold the university's right to determine who shall be taught who shall, who shall teach, what shall be taught, and how it shall be taught without regard to any other criterion except academic merit. This has been the pillar of UCT for many, many centuries. It is an important part, a core part of the ethos of this institution. And the value of academic freedom has protected UCT over many challenges, um, from many challenges over many decades. And I'm hoping that even as we engage in this tradition, we recognize the continued role of upholding academic freedom as an institution. And also just to, again, thank the foresight of the then, uh, the former Chief Justice and UCT Chancellor in 1959, Albert van der Sart St. Livre, who delivered the first T.B. Davy Memorial Lecture back in 1959. It's sometimes um, challenging when we think about the history of where we come from as an institution and the journey that we have traveled to be where we are. Um, we're sitting in this moment and having this conversation because of events that took place in the 1950s um, and many others subsequently. But this is also how we, we guard and protect our institutions and their ethos over time. 30 years, 60 years from now, there will be a new generation sitting here having a similar conversation to what we are having. As we face many challenges, and there will be many other speakers. We've had speakers here, such as Noam Chomsky, uh, Ferial Hafaji, Struggle Stalwarts like Walter Susulu, Helen Joseph, and Kara Asmal, who have spoken here. So it's an important platform of engagement that we memorialize T.B. Devi, but we honor the legacy and the ethos of this institution and the generations that have come before us and had the foresight to put in place principles and values that have protected UCT and led to the stature of the institution that 
we enjoy today. Of course, there will be current challenges that we have to deal with. Last year's um, lecturer was Professor Sakela Bufungu, the Vice Chancellor of um, the University of Forte. And uh, he spoke about academic freedom and institutional autonomy. Um, and the challenges that Forte faces. And many of us read about the challenges that the institution faces from outside. And I think it's a privilege that um, the audience here got to hear a frank analysis of the challenges that the institution faces as a result of events that took place during apartheid that the institution there still struggle with today. So we must acknowledge that academic freedom, it's a contested um, phenomenon, the value system, as it should be. Um, and we will contest how to make sure that it's relevant in every generation and how it applies to every generation, which is why this conversation is important. Um, this is the nature of a university and the need for debate makes it relevant. And as society begins to change in different ways, we also have to adapt our understanding, our interpretation, our application, but at the same time, make sure that the core and essence of it is not lost on us. It's not lost on new generation. It's not lost on our students. We still face it. We face challenges as, as it is in this institution. We having debates about the Gaza resolutions that were taken at Senate and at Council. And um, they've also brought to the surface debates around academic freedom. So again, it's still relevant to us today. At times, we often feel like academic freedom is pitted against social justice. And we have to have those conversations. Um, and we will continue to have them um, as we go into the future, also as we navigate the world around us, which is getting complex, connected intertwined in ways that it wasn't before. We are affected by things that sometimes we think that we are far from, but actually we are very close to. We also have to make sure that in the process, um, we don't damage the institution itself. We've been handed a great institution by generations before us, and we need to make sure that we hand over to the next generation a great institution still. Um, we have to make sure that our structures are not compromised, they continue to function well. Our faculty boards, um, our senate, our council, and all the structures that we have. And at the core of it is the academic project. At the core of what we do. And we've got to make sure that values such as academic freedom that are designed to protect that are also aligned to 
the interventions that we put in place. One measure of this is um, the Academic Freedom Index, which is based on countries measure of five indicators of academic freedom, research and teaching, academic exchange and dissemination, institutional autonomy, campus integrity, and freedom of academic and cultural expression. And um, in the report this year, this index is declining in 23 countries. In 23 countries. And increasing only in 10 countries. And so, all over the world, a population of about 3.6 billion people, they live in countries where academic freedom is restricted. So, we therefore now and then have to introspect and reflect and critique ourselves so that we don't go back to the times when even UCT itself was implicated like what happened in 1968 where the appointment of the anthropologist Achima Ferge was rescinded by council in response to pressure from the apartheid government Um, and 600 students, 10% of the student body at the time, staged a nine-day peaceful occupation of Bremner administration building. So, we're not immune also as UCT. So, we have to be careful and make sure that we don't um, we don't fall into the traps of compromising academic freedom by the decisions that we make um, and spaces like this are critical in helping us insights like what we are about to receive from the lecture today are critical in helping us reflect and introspect. So let me finish off by once again thanking the Academic Freedom Committee of UCT. Um, Thank all the members, the chair. Um, for creating this platform for us today, for inviting our guest, Judge Diret Ladi, to address us this evening on the topic of the narrative as the enemy of freedom of thought. Thank you. Chair Hansen. Thank, thank you, Vice Chancellor. Now I would uh, like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, I, I, I don't think you really need me to introduce him. You can just Google him because that's probably much easier and more accurate. But he has served in, very diff in many uh, roles and, um, and levels both nationally and internationally, as you very well know now that he is um, a judge of, in the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. He has also served in, as um, uh, 
chair as well as member of the United Nations International Law Commission. He has been uh, president of the South African uh, chapter of the International Law Association, but he's also served our country in many areas, in particular as an important advisor of our international, our, in our international um, foreign uh, missions, including being, member, being our international uh, foreign South African mission in the United uh, Nations in, in New York. So he's had all of these. But as I bring him to the fore, I just want to tell you a very short story about something I remembered when, I, when he was about to come here, about something being introduced more than 25 years ago to a Nigerian poet, Neo Shundare, he, who has both been a poet and a dramatist as well as being a, um, a, a social activist. The, he introduced his poetry by saying that his poetry is a cry for open spaces. And this was after the, I think it was 1997 when I met him. It was at the time that people were surviving and trying to recover from the Sunny Abacha leadership in Nigeria. That's why he said his poetry is a cry for open spaces. But the reason I mentioned that is this kind of overlap between being a global citizen activist but an academic in the same time with academic freedom overlaps all those spaces. And so, Judge Gladi used to hold the South African um, Sachi chair in uh, what is called international constitutional law at the University of Pretoria. So this is not a non-academic judge. And the cry for spaces, for me that I heard from Ineo Shindare, was a cry of an academic who basically overlaps his responsibility beyond a narrow narrative of academic that is defined by ivory towers of academia, but by real engagement with the real world. So, Judge Daddy, I, will, I request you to come and deliver the 58th TB Devi Lecture. Ruzani, thank you very much for that warm welcome and introduction. Uh, and Vice Chancellor, thank you for, for your statement, uh, your very moving statement, which I think should remind us of um, the value of academic freedom, um, and because it's so valuable that we should not take it for granted. Um, it's extremely important. Um, I want to thank everyone who's here, who made the time to come here. And I was saying to a friend of mine as I was driving here that I hope, having traveled this far, I'm not met by a room of 20 people. So I'm really grateful that you, <laughs> that you took the time um, to be here. Um, I, just when I stepped in, I bumped into someone, so I'm going to, I hope I don't embarrass him, but uh, I met someone, and, and I just, um, Mr. Martin Mulcahy, who uh, was my high school principal. Um, he, he was a principal of a school that, um, anyone who went to that school holds it very near and dear to their heart. And there's a reason for that. It, was, um, it wasn't just a school. It was a special place. So Martin, I want to say to you, thank you very much. Um, and thank you also for making the time uh, to come and see me. It will be an understatement to say I'm really honored to have been invited to present the 50th T.B. Davy Memorial Lecture at the University of Cape Town. Um, but before I do, I have to, um, uh, I have to make a small confession. I, I've been associated with several universities, um, including one not very far from here, the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, but I've never in any formal way been associated with the University of Cape Town. 
Um, I, I suppose in, in these parts of the world, um, this is a great sin, and so because of that, I, I want to um, express my apology. There was a time when I was this close to coming to the University of Cape Town. I was telling the Vice Chancellor um, last night, it was actually during my stay at the University of Stellenbosch, I bumped into um, one of your former executives, uh, Professor Loretta Ferris, um, who said, Dira, I think it's time for you to go back to academia. At the time, I was working for the Foreign Ministry. Um, and, and I said, you know what, you're probably right. The, the time has come. And I thought, you know, being surrounded by mountains with a sea not very far, um, I probably want to land um, in Cape Town somewhere. Um, I, had, I had several discussions with um, the then acting dean, I think, um, uh, Denwood Chirwa. It is with some regret that I was not able to come eventually uh, for personal reasons, but um, so I was this close. Um, Unfortunately, I, I didn't make it. In any event, I'm, I'm really grateful for UCT for extending this invitation, um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I've also looked at the list of those that have spoken before me, um, and to say they are luminaries would be a great understatement. Uh, so again, for that reason, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled and, and really honored um, that I've been invited to follow in their footsteps. I, I'm not sure that I'm deserving, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful in any event. Um, and just to show you how grateful I am, um, it was, again, I, I shared this with the VC last night um, um, and some other colleagues, I had a very difficult choice to make in coming here. We had agreed on this date many months ago, um, and we agreed on this date based mainly on the calendar of the court and the availability of the vice chancellor. Well. A few weeks ago, uh, after all the preparations had been made, the tickets had been bought, um, the, I guess the flyers had been sent out, uh, the court calendar changed. Now, as a new judge on the court, it's not, it's not good to be missing public uh, <laughs> sitting. So I thought, should I write to UCT and say, you know, um, so, but eventually I decided, well, you know, they'll have to forgive me. So, um, so I'm here, um, and I hope that that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an indication of how honored I was to have been invited um, to deliver this lecture. I'm not sure if the countries of Gabon and Equatorial Guinea will be very happy. <laughs> that I missed uh, this, but you know, they probably wouldn't applaud, but I'm, 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 I'm grateful. As a new judge, I also have to be, or get used to a new reality. And this new reality is that um, my own freedom of expression um, is more limited than it was. Um, those of you that, that know me um, know that I've said some rather controversial things in the past. Um, I mean, I still have personal views like everyone else, um, but as a judge, I guess it is important, particularly in public forums, that I do not make utterances that might appear to prejudge current cases, future cases, uh, you know, maybe even potential cases. So with this in mind, I'd like to say two things, well, maybe two and a half, three things. Uh, first of all, I, I cannot speak about ongoing cases. Um, there is a case that I know everyone is interested in, everyone is excited about, some maybe don't like it so much. Um, the South Africa-Israel case, um, I won't be able to speak about that, obviously. I won't be able to speak about another interesting case, Gambia versus Myanmar. Uh, there's been rumors about a new case that we might get um, against Afghanistan relating to discrimination against women. I won't be able to speak about that case. Um, you know not just in the presentation, but also in the question and answer session. I always say, feel free to ask the question. I am also free um, not to respond. And sometimes even if I am able to respond, maybe um, um, to specific things, my responses will necessarily have to be rather circumscribed. So that's the first thing. <clears throat> um, the second thing is actually a plea to you. Um, I'm, I'm going to say several things. Um, uh, some of the things I'm going to say, if they're taken out of context, may be misinterpreted. Um, so this is a plea to you. If you are going to uh, 
um, tweet or X or Facebook or I don't know what other platforms are, if you're going to do any of those, feel free to do so. Uh, but please try as much as you can to, to do so in the context in which um, the statements um, are made. There is a related point. I give many examples um, and anecdotes in, in this lecture. Uh, but please, the examples that I give do not necessarily reflect my views on any particular issue. In fact, I've tried to give them in such a way that you will not be able to know what my particular position on the issue is. Um, uh, if you want to know my views on many of these issues that I have written on, then I think you should go and, and read the stuff that I wrote before I was a judge when I w was free to say all of these things. <laughs> right? So these are the things that I would ask for your assistance in. So, the title of my talk today is The Narrative as the Enemy of Freedom of Thought. That's the title that I gave uh, to the organizers. But in fact, the theme will be, at least in some sense, a little broader. Um, it will broadly be about tyranny of the narrative. So not just restricted to freedom of expression, but to freedom in general. Um, of course, there will be a bias towards freedom of expression and, 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 and freedom of thought. Uh, um, but, and this is the second caveat um, about the topic, on reflection, as I was preparing for the talk, I decided that the talk should be a little more nuanced than what the title reflects. So the title presents the narrative as the enemy of freedom almost in absolute terms. Um, and in this lecture, I think it's important to be a little more nuanced. So I would say the theme would probably be something like the potential tyranny of the narrative. Uh, a third caveat. Um, I have not often had the opportunity to speak about topics that are not related to international law, to speak about uh, subjects other than international law. I will try to do that today. So this is, this is new for me, I'll try. But as an international lawyer, um, the topic will be presented through the prism, not so much of international law, but of events that are relevant for international law. Uh, that's at least for my own comfort. Um, you could do this topic through, I guess, you know, any number of, of prisms. As originally conceived when I, you know, when I was, uh, I don't know if pressured is the right word, but when I was pressured to give a title, very early on, uh, you know, in the midst of all of these cases, um, and I just threw out this topic, uh, um, the narrative, uh, it was really intuitive. It was uh, a topic, as you will see, which was based on my own experience as a quote unquote, a victim of the narrative. So for me, the word narrative is not a scientific, academic, or intellectual term. Um, it was a word that I had conjured up in my mind when thinking about particular events in my experience um, as a diplomat, lawyer diplomat, academic lawyer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was fairly recently, and when I say recently, I mean a couple of weeks, that I learned that narrative was not just a word, that behind this word, there was a whole field of study with many books and many scholarly articles having been dedicated to the science of the narrative. Which means that if you are an expert in narrative theory or narrative science, you'll probably be disappointed um, that I'm not going to offer you any new insights. So, but I'll share with you, the, the first time that I ever used the word narrative, at least in the context in which I plan to use it today, was in 2011. If you cast your mind back to 2011, you'll remember that it was the Arab Spring. Um, um, and in this particular moment, it was February, actually. Um, I was sitting in the Security Council cons consultation room as a legal advisor to the South African Permanent Mission in New York, and we were discussing a text, the ambassador and I were discussing a text of a resolution that eventually became known as Resolution 1970. It's a famous resolution. Um, if you're a lawyer, you'll know it. If you're an international lawyer, you'll know it. Um, it is that resolution which referred the situation in Libya 
to the International Criminal Court. And then I recall saying to the ambassador at that time that the narrative, and I don't know where this word came from at that moment, but the narrative created pressure on us to vote in a particular way. So even though there were good legal reasons, maybe even good political reasons, but good legal reasons to vote against the resolution, the narrative made it almost impossible. Uh, by the way, I'll come back to the good legal reasons later in, in, in the context of another resolution. So that was in April, uh, sorry, that was in February 2011. Um, A few months after that, on several occasions, I had yet again an opportunity to sort of use this word narrative, um, um, if not in discussions with the ambassador, then at least in my head. Um, you know, the first occasion um, after this February was in another Libya-related resolution, another famous Libya-related resolution, 1973, uh, which of course, as you will know, um, authorized the use of force um, in Libya. Uh, also, run about the same time, was also run about April, May of 2011 um, in the course of discussions of yet another resolution. Um, so the Security Council was very busy at that moment. Um, this was resolution 1975, so you see 1970, 73, 75, so all of them run about the same time, um, a resolution on Côte d'Ivoire. Um, and there I had to think about the apparent narrative um, which seemed to be supporting Ouattara over a Bagbo. The first time that it occurred to me that there was actually a whole area of study dedicated to this notion of narrative was during a discussion just a couple of weeks ago with a PhD student who was studying in Maastricht. Um, and he had asked me for an interview. Uh, he's not my student, somebody else's student, and he had asked me for an interview. His PhD was on the international, how the International Court of Justice handles uh, factual and historical issues. And he had sent me a list of questions, um, and in the list of questions he had sent me, uh, I saw that there was something about narrative theory. And of course, I immediately thought to this, um, um, this lecture, my eyes bulged, my heart palpitated at the thought <laughs> that I was due to give a lecture on a subject which, unbeknownst to me, had a whole theory. <laughs> it felt, at that moment, it felt like giving a lecture on deconstruction without ever having heard of Jacques Derrida, or psychoanalysis without ever having heard of Freud. Daunting. Anyway, in the course of the conversation, as he explained to me how he understood the word narrative, narrative theory, I then remembered I watched a movie not too long ago called Life Itself. I don't know how many people have seen this movie. It's a wonderful movie. And I guess one of the central themes, questions in this movie was whether life itself could be, cut, could be trusted to be a reliable narrator, or whether life itself also had an agenda, and that the way it narrated or told its story was also biased, agenda-filled. All of this to say, by the way, that the title of my lecture contains the word narrative. I am no expert on narrative or narrative theory. In fact, I'm quite ignorant of the field, and I own this ignorance. Huh? Um, but while I use the word narrative more anecdotally than scientifically, I, I was pleasantly surprised. When last week I had to now put something on paper because I had to say something, um, I was pleasantly surprised when I did a, a cursory survey of the literature on narrative that my own informal colloquial understanding of narrative was not completely divorced from the more academic understanding or understandings of the concept. So before turning to the narrative's impact on freedom of thought, on freedom, um, generally speaking, I would like to maybe say something about how I understand the concept of narrative. <laughs> A narrative, simply put, is a story. Um, if you, well, when I checked the dictionary, it said that uh, it is an account of connected events which is used to tell a story. So in this context, narratives provide the possibility for taking events that are known to us and using them to represent the state of the world, to create the world, to create a worldview 
to reimagine or to imagine the world. So we use narrative. We create these stories to make sense of the world around us and the events in it. So with narrative, we are, we are taking some things, some events, we connect them, and then we turn them into something else, something larger than the sum of its hold, the story, this worldview. History is an apt example of the narrative. I mean, all of us in this room know that history is depicted, um, uh, that how history is depicted depends on the narrator. History is not, as we all learned in primary school, a report of events in the distant past. History is of necessity the representation of events of the past in a way that tells a story. In fact, you might know that the French word for history, histoire, is exactly the same word for story, histoire. So history is about telling a story, and by telling a story, you establish a worldview, or at least you create the conditions for establishing a worldview or entrenching it. Right? And very often, if not always, behind this establishment of a worldview is an agenda. The 1857 uprising by Indians against the Brits is referred to by the British as the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Who, who's rebellious? Naughty little children, yes? But to Indians, it's not a rebellion. They refer to it as the first Indian War of Liberation. Because there's something powerful about these choice of words. And I think it's because each side has created its own narrative about that single event. Each side seeks to create and entrench a view. Each side has an agenda, right? Let's think back to perhaps the most consequential event of our recent history, the Second World War. Had Germany won the Second World War, our history books would perhaps look very different. The genocide committed by Germany against the Jews would maybe be presented as an exercise of the right of self-defense against an encroaching threat that sought to weaken the German race and culture. The invasion of several countries in Europe, and perhaps eventually elsewhere, might have been now represented as a just war against the repression that Germany faced by the victors of the First World War. Right? So it wouldn't be necessary to drastically change the events to create a different narrative. The same events, mass killings of a population, invasion of territories, but a very different story, a very different worldview. Consequences of that story might be, if one can think about this uh, different narrative, that in Germany, the description of the Holocaust as a genocide may be unlawful. In the same way that Holocaust denial is currently unlawful now in Germany. I want to pause now and just remind you that before thinking about this lecture, before actually typing and putting down words on paper, I had never thought sufficiently deeply about narrative. So for me, narrative was a word that I associated with negative impulses and negative recollections. The result is that up until the point I started preparing for this lecture, narrative had always had a negative meaning and a negative connotation. It was in preparing this talk and this lecture that I realized that actually narrative does not have to be negative. It does not have to have a negative connotation. Um, it does not have to be false. Right? So, neg um, so, so narratives can be true. The narratives concerning Nazi atrocities or apartheid or the genocide against uh, former Yugoslavia or in Rwanda and so on um, are all probably a true reflection, a true representation of reality pieced together by events. Yet this worldview, this construction of reality from events, positive or not, remains a narrative. Let me take a couple of examples um, that all of us can relate to. The dominant narrative in American politics is that Donald Trump is, at the very least, odd or weird, at least. <laughs> um, 
And that narrative is very difficult to argue against in reasonable company. You only have to think about some of the statements. You know, African states as what, what, whole countries. Grab them by the what, what, what's. Migrants eat dogs and pets, right? Each of these examples are events that we can piece together and that have been pieced together to develop a narrative. And from these events, it's, it's not difficult to see why those that have created the dominant theory have arrived at that conclusion. But there are two caveats that must accompany the statement that narratives are sometimes, maybe even often, true and reliable. First, ultimately, the creation of a narrative is an interpretative act. That interpretative process may result in an objectively correct representation of reality, but that does not change the fact that the process itself is interpretative. And if it's interpretative, there's always a great measure of subjectivity. Let's take the Trump examples. If you grab them by the what what's piece of the puzzle, well, that might be explained as nothing more than personal banter. Each and every one of us in this room, in our personal space, may say or do things that would shock those that, hire, that, that have a high opinion of us. You only need to think about a previous, very beloved former US president and his private actions in the Oval Office. Right? The statement about African countries being toilet countries. Well, it's not the best choice of words. It's demeaning and maybe a generalization. But if you go to the core of what is meant, some will say that it's empirically correct. Right? So what about the statement concerning migrants and what they eat? Well, that one is a little more difficult to explain. But, but the ludicrousy of that statement depends on whether or not it's true. Now, I don't think it's true. I'm quite sure it's not true. But that's a factual question, and I'm sure there are many people that believe that it's true. Another narrative, which is especially popular outside of the United States, concern US foreign policy and how it is more open, how it is better, in fact, under US presidents than under Republican presidents. Now, this is one narrative that I can tell you I do not believe is true, but it is a firmly well-believed narrative. I have anecdotal evidence of its incorrectness, um, but I want to refer first to someone called Dieter Kraft, who you probably don't know. Yeah. Dieter Kraft is a fictional character in my first attempt at writing fiction. Um, and in a particular scene, Dieter Kraft, I really like this guy, but he's German. Uh, um, at the time, he was the prosecutor of the ICC, and what he's doing is he's comparing narratives around the prosecutors of the International Criminal Court, um, in particular, the first prosecutor, um, Ocampo, and the second prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda. So he's comparing those narratives to narratives around US presidents. So this book was written in 2012, so it was way before Trump um, so it's, the comparison is limited to Bush and Obama. And I'd like to read to you what Dieter Kraft says. He's a very smart guy. <laughs> he says, oh, and he's speaking to a young, um, a young fellow that he's about to mentor. He says, it was kind of like Obama following on from George W. Bush. Bush demanded respect from the world. Obama said, I will give you respect. He, that's Obama, offered a listen and learn kind of leadership as opposed to the bullying of Bush. What rubbish? Well, I mean, Dieter Kraft doesn't use rubbish. He uses a much stronger word that I don't think I will use now. But it worked. The world loved Obama because he was the antithesis of Bush. And yet, at least internationally, he pursued the very same objectives. So now he turns to the ICC and he says, this woman, this is um, Fatou Ben Souda, charmed the world and made the ICC look like a caring mother and friend. Not the bogeyman that was going to get you. She is referring to Ocampo. But of course you might say, well, that's fiction. Um, you know, this, this Dieter Kraft doesn't even exist. 
So I will give you something that is not fiction. Um, in an article I wrote not, not many years ago, around about 2020 um, in, in the Chinese Journal of International Law, um, I had this to say about very much the same theme. So as you can see, my fiction and my, uh, my academic work, are always, they always reinforce each other. Uh, and there I had to say, the US under Donald Trump has borne the brunt of international lawyers' critique of populism. Yet, I have always held the view that US foreign policy is consistent across political parties and presidents. What differs is the style. It is the case that Trump has taken this policy to another level, but this is just a matter of degree and not substance. Trump's policies may best be described as US foreign policy on steroids. Climate change, one of the flagstone issues, raised to show the dangers of populism, is a case in point. While it's true that Trump withdrew from the Paris Agreement, it is equally true that previous administrations did not join the Kyoto Protocol, advancing very much the same rhetoric as Trump's statement announcing the withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. George W. Bush, for example, in repudiating the Kyoto Protocol, stated that he would not accept the protocol since it would harm the economy and hurt workers. Now, while Obama administration is credited with progressive attitude towards climate change, it should be recalled that that administration itself did not support the Kyoto Protocol. Close quote. Now, I had hoped to avoid spending too much time on US politics, but as I'm sure you know, it's a treasure trove of the tyranny of the narrative. Uh, but so is South Africa. Yeah? Uh, so forgive me one more illustration from US foreign policy about how events are tied together to create a narrative that may or may not be true. Everyone knows about uh, the less than warm relationship between the United States and the International Criminal Court. Well, in 2009, immediately after the ascension to power of Barack Obama, the US actually began courting the ICC. The US was present and engaging at many meetings. In fact, during the annual meeting of states parties in 2009, uh, held that year in, in The Hague, um, the US delegation far outnumbered, and just for emphasis, I will say by far, all the other delegations, even though it was not a state party. Now, the common narrative, which is obviously actively propagated by the United States and accepted by most of everyone I spoke to, was that this was a positive sign that the US wanted to re-engage in a positive relationship with the ICC. So this is the narrative was that the US was back in the fold and we should all open our arms in collective welcome. I had a rather pessimistic view of this new era of engagement. My view, which did not fit with the narrative, was that US active engagement with the ICC was actually designed to disrupt negotiation on the activation of the crime of aggression. The negotiations, which were scheduled to end and conclude in 2010 in Kampala. Um, I remain convinced that I'm true. I can't prove it, but I remain convinced that I'm true. And you only need to look at the engagement leading up to Kampala to see the US position, which was to restrict the power of the ICC to investigate and prosecute that crime to situations that were approved by the Security Council, essentially then giving it a veto. By the way, this is not a criticism of US foreign policy. It's not about UN foreign policy at all. Um, this is simply about creation of narratives, whether false or not, and how they're created. Before moving to the second caveat, I, I, I want to recall that uh, narratives can also be relative and context specific. So, for example, in certain parts of the world, among certain racial groups, among certain religious groups, among certain professions, economic status, et cetera, et cetera, there may be a dominant narrative which is different from a narrative elsewhere. If you think about the Israel-Palestinian conflict, for example, one would expect that in the Muslim world, the dominant narrative paints Palestinians in positive light and Israel in, well, less positive light. Similarly, in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the narrative that might be the dominant one in certain categories and certain communities may not be so dominant throughout. 
I'm often amused um, in South Africa about how people determine the pulse of the nation by what they hear on what one might call sophisticated radio stations. And I won't say which ones those are, but you know. As if villages and the rural world do not exist and do not contribute to the pulse of the nation. But anyway, that's another story. Very often a dominant narrative can be challenged by, a, by an emerging narrative. Before the year 2000, Nelson Mandela's status as a revered leader was virtually unquestioned in our country, I think. Today, the sounds of Mandela as a sellout are not uncommon, particularly amongst the youth of South Africa. But to this point, if you think back from 1960 right up until about the 1990s, in many parts of the world, that same Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. And yet, for decades thereafter, he was seen as the most iconic world leader of his time, even in those parts of the world where he was seen as a terrorist. So, narrative changes, narrative is relative, narrative is context specific. So now I come to the second caveat. The, sec the second caveat to the statement that narratives can be true. It is that even if they're true, even if they are an accurate reflection of the world, they can still lead to tyranny of the majority by preventing the holding of opinions that go against the narrative or expression of thought that is seen to undermine the dominant narrative. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on, on this. This is really the core, I guess. So remember now, narrative is useful for making sense of the world around us and the events in it. But as I said, they can create conditions of tyranny. I've been at the International Criminal Court now for seven or eight months, give or take. What do you think the most common question I get is? The most common question I get, especially when I'm in South Africa, the funny thing is uh, I haven't received that question this time around, but the most common question I get is not how do you find the court? What's your favorite case? The most common question is tell us about the vice president of the ICJ or some version of that question. Very often there's the phrase that lady or that woman. Now in the context specific and relative nature of narrative, the anti-Israel narrative, whether correct or not, that's besides the point, applies in certain communities. Therefore, a judge elected to apply her own individual mind to issues is expected to think in a particular way, presumably because she's from Africa, or maybe because she's black, I don't know. But this is an illustration of tyranny. Leaving aside whether or not you agree with the reasons she puts forward, what I find interesting is people never engage with those reasons. It's, we know how you voted, and therefore, Judge Tladi, what do you think of the vice president of the court? So because the views of the judge do not accord with the dominant narrative, very often dehumanizing and demeaning statements are directed at the judge. Remember, as human beings, we are entitled, should be entitled, to freedom of thought, regardless of how unpopular those views are. This is particularly the case when you have been elected to a position that requires you to exercise independent thought and judgment. So the vitriol is particularly disconcerting. By the way, so whether I agree with her or not is besides the point, uh, but I can certainly sympathize because I've been in that situation several times. Um, uh, by the way, that's probably the limit of what I can say about that issue. So, so as I said, I, I've been the subject of tyranny myself on a number of occasions, uh, but the best example um, in my case is a situation of a former Sudanese president, Omar Hassan al-Bashir, who is also in some circles known as the great escape artist. <laughs> you know why, it was worth a try. 
But this example illustrates how insidious the narrative tyranny can be. And it's also easy to give it because I guess Bashir is no longer an issue. So the narrative in that situation was that al-Bashir was guilty of one of the worst cases of genocide against Tafurians. I add one of the worst cases of genocide only for effect because, I mean, a genocide is so terrible that all genocides are bad and they're, you, know, you know, there shouldn't be degrees. But you see, it's important for narratives to add these adjectives and adverbs because it is these adjectives and adverbs that turns him into an enemy of the international community as a whole. And thus, so the narrative continues, he has to be punished at all costs. Just to be clear, I have never questioned the narrative. It may or may not be true, but I think the fact that a court of law, like the International Criminal Court, felt it had sufficient evidence to indict and issue an arrest warrant, suggests that it's at least plausible. But whether the narrative is true or not is besides the point. It's immaterial. So let's just assume for the purpose of this conversation that it's true. I'm not going to go into the legal subtleties because I promise you I'd avoid international law. But while I accepted the narrative and accepted that the ICC was justified in seeking to try Mr. Bashir in The Hague, I also argued on the basis of international law, a subject that I know much better than a, um, uh, narratives, that South Africa could not lawfully arrest them. That was essentially the point I was making. My argument was never I have never said, my argument was never said that he was not guilty, never that the ICC was wrong to seek to have him tried. Rather, it was because of particular rules of international law, states were not entitled to arrest him unless authorized to do so by the Security Council. These are legal technicalities, but these legal technicalities that I raise would work elsewhere in other situations, but not against someone like him because of the narrative, especially because this narrative had powerful backers. I have never received so many hate messages. Um, I was, there's a well-known South African professor who resides in the US um, who referred to me in um, an interview uh, with the Pretoria News as the protector of the devil. It's public. There were, to my mind, two problems with the atmosphere that's created by the narrative. First, because of who Bashir is, he was no longer entitled to protection that the law offers to many others. The law of immunity was not the figment of my imagination, I promise you. I didn't make it up. It was real. And incredible gymnastics had to be performed to create the illusion that it did not exist, at least in that case. Second, the power of the narrative meant that anyone who presented even reasonable arguments that might be interpreted as undermining the narrative was to be ostracized. So freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of judgment, all of it undermined because of narrative. I'd like to share one further personal anecdote that illustrates the pull of the narrative. This particular one even has a name. Um, it's called whataboutism. Have you heard about whataboutism? Yeah. Uh, I've tried to avoid legalese, but for this one, I will need to just say a couple of things about the prohibition on the use of force. I have always adopted a very restricted approach to the law and the prohibition on the use of force, which is to say, I believe that there are only a limited number of justifications for using force on international law. And what's more, even more importantly, that these should be interpreted very restrictively. To put it simply, I just simply don't like violence. Now, for more than a decade, I've engaged with those on the opposite side of the spectrum. Very respected international lawyers who have pushed for what I viewed as a very permissive approach to the prohibition on the use of force, an approach that I have described as placing the content of the rules on the prohibition on the use of force in the eye of the beholder. They mean whatever the person who's speaking think they mean, so they don't have any objective content. Now, when Russia began its, depending on your narrative, either aggression or special military operations in 2022, 
and international lawyers were seeking to shout from the top of the mountain at the top of their lungs about the unlawfulness of the act, some of us said, hang on, many of you are now calling on us to condemn this, but when we raised similar issues in the past, all that you did was you poo-pooed on us and you told us about exceptions. So what aboutism was created? Now, at the time, I was president of the South African branch of the International Law Associations, and many associations like ours were issuing statements condemning the Russian actions. In fact, our parent entity in London had also issued a statement. Some members of our branch, some from the law faculty at the University of Cape Town, wrote to me to suggest that we, no, it wasn't you. <laughs> it wasn't you, Kathy wrote to me to suggest that we should also issue a statement. Um, of course, I, I refused, um, and I gave these reasons that I've just given you. But this posture frustrated many because, hey, the world was united against the Russian invasion. And to refuse to issue a statement would be to go against the narrative. So what, raising what I thought were legitimate questions about double standards, was given this pejorative name, whataboutism. And those that raised these questions were labeled as Russian apologists or supporters of Russian action. As if it's not possible to question Russian action without pointing out double standards reflected in the explosion of statements and the sudden interest in the sanctity of the prohibition of the use of force. Um, but the point is, what aboutism emerges also as a tool to protect the narrative and to shut down debate. And in this way, it's also an apt reflection of the tyranny of the narrative. How is a narrative able to achieve this? Recall what I said earlier, that narratives are about creating stories. Narratives are associated with storytelling. What is one of the most important elements in a good story. A good protagonist needs a good, or rather bad actually, antagonist. So Superman, a good Superman story, needs a Luther. Just like James Bond needs a Le Chivre or Blofeld or Goldfinger or Dr. No and so on. When Bond uses his license to kill Dr. No, we do not ask for due process. We don't nor will we countenance some suggestion that puts Blofeld's action in good light. You just can't do that. The tyranny of the narrative is made possible by the creation of angels and demons, heroes and villains. Heroes and angels can do no wrong. Villains and demons can do no right. Villains and demons lose all the protection of law and of society. Villains and demons are cast as the enemy, not just of some, but of the whole international community. And utterances that might be interpreted as being in the interest of the villain or demon, cast the utterer as part of the network of evil, as a result of some exaggerated form of you are either with us or with the evil. So a statement such as, South Africa owes Sudan a duty to respect the immunity of its head of state, is suddenly transformed into Bashir is innocent, hands off Bashir. But by the way, recalling that narrative is context specific and maybe relative, the reverse is also true. A statement that Bashir should be prosecuted might cast the speaker as a supporter of Western imperialism. A statement questioning the unequal treatment of cases of breaches of the use of force is treated as support for Russian action in Ukraine. Trump's foreign policy is not very different from US foreign policy in general, is transformed into, I support Trump and I wish he wins. I don't understand the constitutional court's decision that the public protector's recommendations are binding becomes 100% Zulu boy. I support <laughs> Zulu. A statement that one is not sure if the situation in the occupied Palestinian territory is apartheid is transformed into Israel has a right to be there. 
asking whether COVID vaccines have serious side effects, transforms the person asking into a COVID denialist and conspiracy theorist. Statements such as, you will like this one, there is too much corruption in government, these are turned into, the white apartheid government was better. This one I definitely can't leave out since I'm in Cape Town. Cape Town is the best city in South Africa, is rendered into, the DA is the best party. Right? I can give many examples, immigration, xenophobia, climate change, uh, any number of issues. Um, and by the way, each of these examples can be reversed. Right? Um, the point is that the creation of narratives becomes a powerful tool for shutting down conversation. It closes down space for meaningful engagement. Yet conversations are important, not just as an expression of freedom of thought and expression, but also as the means the pathway to the creation of a better and more fair world. The tyranny of narrative takes away the possibility of communication for open exchange, and I'll, I believe ultimately for a better world. I would like to provide an example of the dangers of tyranny um, of the narrative. So earlier on when I began, I said that um, the first time I recall using the word narrative was in the context of uh, 2011 resolution negotiations concerning the situation in Libya, um, in which the situation in Libya was referred to the ICC. Now I said then that there may have been good legal reasons not to support that resolution. Well, that resolution was a copy and paste of a previous resolution. In 2005, I don't know what I was doing in 2005. Um, the Security Council adopted another famous resolution, 1593, on the situation in Darfur. That's the resolution, by the way, that made it possible to issue an arrest warrant against, uh, against um, the great escape artist. Now, in 2005, Brazil was on the Security Council, and it fully, fully supported the referral. So it supported the narrative, this narrative that there was a genocide and that the international community needed to do something to arrest it. However, Brazil in 2005 was concerned that Resolution 1593 as drafted would in fact undermine international criminal justice. And it would do so in three ways. First, Brazil argued, by the way, um, on this, I absolutely agree with Brazil. You don't have to try to figure out you know, where I stand. I think Brazil is correct. Uh, so first, Brazil said, Resolution 1593 undermined international criminal justice because it did not create or establish a duty on all states to cooperate with the ICC in the arrest and surrender of ICC fugitives. By the way, if Brazil had gotten its way on this issue, the Bashir situation would not have been an issue because we would not be talking about immunity. There would be a duty absolutely to arrest them without any exceptions, right? So it would have been good if Brazil had gotten its way. Second, the resolution denied the ICC funding from the United Nations for investigations and prosecutions of Darfur related claims, contrary to the basic idea underlying UN Security Council referrals. Right, that these U UN Security Council referrals were actually done on behalf of the UN as a whole, on behalf of the international community. Third, the resolution, and for me this, was, this is really the most important one, the resolution sought to exclude certain military personnel from certain countries from the universal jurisdiction of other states for crimes committed in Darfur. Something which in Brazil's view, and mine as well, went against international law. Now, there's no prizes for guessing why this resolution had these fundamental flaws. It's not that the drafters didn't know, they knew. It was the price of doing business. Right? But Brazil was very unhappy with the resolution because it went against the very ideals underlying the narrative. The resolution itself undermined the pursuit of justice, according to Brazil. Yet, because of the strength of the narrative, the nuance underlying Brazil's position fell on deaf ears. As it turns out, it abstained from the resolution and was severely criticized from many quarters for acting against the interests of justice, even though it was clearly acting in the interests of justice. Today, ICC activists decry the very same issues that Brazil was concerned about in 2005. 
And if you know anything about how the UN works, you will know that because of that resolution, it will be very difficult, if not near impossible, to change the structure of future UN Security Council referrals in the future because of um, the insistence on sticking to agreed language. So the tyranny of the narrative can sometimes weaken even the very positive ideals and values that underlie the narrative itself. I should make myself absolutely clear, I'm not suggesting, at least not today, I mean, two weeks ago I would have, but today I'm not suggesting that narrative is bad, that narrative is evil, that narrative is tyrannical, no. Um, narratives are a necessary part of the human existence. The creation of narratives allow us to make sense of the world that we live in. Narrative, in fact, creates the possibility for us to make progress on very important questions. The notion that apartheid is a crime against humanity that needs to be stamped out is a narrative. A narrative that was very important for bringing South Africa out of the darkness of apartheid. So, so narratives have an, an important role to play. Also, the argument I'm making, what I'm suggesting, these thoughts I'm sharing with you, is not that there aren't demons and villains in the world. I accept, again, without question, the narrative that Nazi Germany was evil and that its main proponents were evil and that those that fought against it were heroes. What I could not accept, however, is a notion that the rights ordinarily available to others, such as the right to a fair trial, due process, could be denied to them. I accept, again without question, that apartheid regime was evil, as were those that propagated it, and that those that fought against it were heroes. But I do not accept, cannot accept, that we cannot question the conduct of the heroes for any crimes that they may have committed in the fight for liberation. Nor can I accept the vilification of those who express views that even I find distasteful, such as life was much better under apartheid. Express the views so that we can test those views in the marketplace of ideas. What I'm saying is that narrative, true or not, does not provide an excuse for tyranny against freedoms. Thus, it is not the narrative that is the problem. It is the weaponization of narratives to prevent conversation and freedom that is a problem. I would like to go slightly off tangent. Um, a thought that came to my mind this morning, so it's not quite developed, um, perhaps the next time I'm invited to UCT. I think narratives should be weaponized against injustice inequity and inequality. I mean, the narrative that the current configuration, for example, of the UN Security Council is untenable is generally accepted. Yet I do not see the same amount of energy pursued into writing that situation as I see for some of the objectives that I've spoken about earlier. What about poverty? Why is the pursuit of poverty, of a poverty-free world, not undergirded by a narrative as powerful as some of these that we have seen? So it seems the weaponization of narratives, including when directed at freedoms, is really only possible when emanating from certain segments of society. So the source of the narrative determines the power behind it, I think. I haven't thought too hard about it, but I, you know, I feel that intuitively. Let me conclude by saying the following. We live in a world filled with disasters, a world in which untold savagery and violence is unleashed on many populations. As human beings, we are programmed to, designed to make sense of the savagery and violence. And we do this by creating narratives. Narratives are a normal process by which we can make sense of the world. Narratives allow us to make decisions about what course of action to take to right the wrongs. Unfortunately, narratives can also serve to stifle debate. Through the powerful use of protagonists, antagonists, heroes and villains, angels and demons, narratives have sometimes, maybe often, been used to deny ordinarily available rights, to deny the search for meaning, even to deny the ability to question the narrative. It is when this happens that we find ourselves confronted by the dangers of narrative. When narrative comes face to face with and undermines freedom of thought and freedom of expression, when narrative becomes the enemy of freedom. It is when this happens that the tyranny of the narrative reveals itself. Thank you very much.
Um, I'm going to allow a couple of questions or any comments. Um, just make you aware that we've got a, 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 um, a kind of a hard uh, stop anticipated because if we don't do that, he's going to miss his flight. So when he leaves here, he's going straight to the airport. So we're going to allow a couple of um, questions. So there was a recent amazing judgment which I think really does capture for me the importance of narrative in the pursuit of justice, which was um, the opening of inquests after the apartheid period. And many people, I think, ask the question whether the use of public resources and, in fact, courts is an appropriate vehicle. And to me, it was always intuitively such an important thing, because even if there are no prosecutions, the narrative attaching to the passing of someone's life is so important about, and, and surely goes to the very heart of justice. So maybe as a provocation, mm -hmm. narrative is perhaps also a necessary component of justice itself and, and the role of the court, and not just an exterior vehicle that, that is engaged with. Again, I'm not perhaps articulating it as well, um, but I thought that, that what the, the point you're, you're raising is so critical, but perhaps in reverse, where the specter of injustice arises from the narrative itself. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, 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 I can't really comment on it. I think that abs that's absolutely correct. Um, and that's why the, the, the point that I, I try to emphasize over and over again is that narrative is very necessary, and it could be very necessary also for that, that point, where narratives um, uh, are used to fuel injustice. So when narratives are used to fuel injustice, uh, narratives um, in whatever form, and by the way, remember court, proceeding, court procedures and court proceedings are also a form of narrative, right? That's, that's how we create narratives. And so that's one way to challenge narratives that deny justice through using courts, through using different mediums of narratives to challenge narratives that undermine um, um, justice. So I think that's absolutely correct. Thank you very much for this lecture. Because I want to ask about, as you will know, narrative and the truth are authorized by power and rest on the denial of being a merely fabrication. So I wonder how the question of power come to your office and how the question of power do manipulate international law, do make things change. And of course, you might be a judge, and as you know, you might know the truth, but narrative restricts you from taking the right decision. So to which extent this narrative take over the right decision, and how power are involved in fabricating this narrative? So, uh, so that's an interesting point. Um, I'll say two things about that. So, so one thing I will say is I think that power is absolutely at the heart of the creation of narratives, at least how strong narratives are. Yeah, so remember I spoke about how, um, how narratives are relative um, and context specific. Narratives that stick, so there are some narratives that don't stick and some narratives stick. Narratives that stick, I think, absolutely come from power. That's where this tangential thought of mine came from, right? So I think that that's absolutely correct. Um, I'm right. The second point though, is, uh, well, this was actually your question, is to what extent, as I understand your question, to what extent are judges uh, constrained by narratives from making the right choices? Yeah. Um, I think it works both ways, right? I think very often judges in my experience, and this is both international judges and domestic judges, um, act under the duress or the pressure of narratives, either to pursue justice and to arrive at a just solution, or some the opposite way. Right? Um, but it's hard for me to think, um, you know, as a judge, that, that I personally could be constrained by the power of narratives to arrive at a decision that's incorrect. We're all human beings. I, you know, I often say to people, um, so, so as a judge, you walk into a courtroom with a policy position. I mean, anyone who tells you that a judge 
goes into a courtroom you know, without a position is, um, is being less than honest. But, and this is the, the importance of, of, of um, uh, the, function and, the function and independence of a, of a judge, is that you have to leave your mind open to being convinced even against your own policy position, right? Um, so which means there's a narrative, right? which means there's a narrative, a story that's told by counsel. There's a counter narrative, another story, a different worldview that's told by another counsel. And you have to, as a judge, leave yourself open to arriving at decisions that are contrary to what you thought when you walked into the, the courtroom. In my very short time at the court, this has already happened several times. We're walking in, I thought, this is the position that I think is the correct position based on whatever, um, um, based on whatever narrative may have been a, do a dominant one in my mind. But I have been convinced. But I have been convinced. So I think it's possible, and I think it works both ways. Judge, um, good evening. Uh, my question, or the original question was the thing you touched tangentially on, which is the origin of what is the source of the narrative. And the question I was going to ask initially was, what is the source and how are these narratives created, which you say forms sort of a background to entirely what you're speaking about, how we determine disputes in, in the legal system. But just as an example that you used about the, um, the Second World War, the Previous sort of view was Nazis were bad, the Allies were good, and you used the term heroes. That has been substantially revised, as you're aware, over decades. And now the Allied sort of position in all its manifestations, Churchill is viewed very differently as it was viewed after the war, etc., what he did in the East. The point being, <clears throat> any narrative system can be revised with the benefit of hindsight and more information. So our constitution, for instance, provides a normative um, position which most people acclaimed unreservedly 30 years ago. Many still do. We now begin to look on it as we implement it with perhaps a different view. Some of it is aspirational, but it itself is not just as there is nothing which is absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. It's a series. Our constitution is a series of choices and compromises. And if that is the background to which we, against which we resolve disputes, including in a different context, international disputes, if there is no absolute right or wrong, and if the narrative is, is something which itself can change, depending on who gives rise to it, how do we ever know that we are on the correct track in any of these disputes which we face, both internationally and, and locally? How do we know indeed? Um, so, so what I will say is that I, uh, so before answering your direct question, I still think that the Constitution is an excellent document. It's an excellent, um, yes, it's an excellent uh, document. Yes, with it is based on compromises, but sometimes compromises produce the right result. And, and I think this is, um, so this is the case here. How do we know whether or not the narrative, so the narrative or the outcome of any discussion is, um, is right or wrong. It's precisely through communication and conversation. It's precisely through allowing even those views, those narratives um, that we might find unpopular, that we might find, I can't, I mean, so when I speak to, or when I used to speak to young people at my university, um, um, at the University of Pretoria, it's, it's, it's not my university anymore, at the University of Pretoria, uh, <laughs> old habits. Um, internally, I would be really frustrated by discussions like, um, this constitution is an imperialist constitution, Mandela is a sellout. But I think it's important to have that conversation. These might be my views now, strongly held views, but they could be wrong in 50 years from now, 10 years from now. Um, indeed, there could be a completely different narrative. The dominant narrative might well be that, you know, um, so Mandela was a sellout, that this constitution is a, who knows? But I, the, the only way that you can test it is by actually allowing all of these views 
in the marketplace of ideas so that you can test them. And it's through that testing that narratives evolve, uh, for better or worse, by the way, right? Um, so, but I think that's, the, that, that's precisely the point of why we should guard against the, ty the tyranny of the narrative. That the fact that there's a dominant narrative does not mean we are not to question. Questioning different views remain important, um, precisely to allow for this evolution if necessary. Judge, thank you for the lecture. I think it was deeply, deeply insightful. Um, I, I'm curious as to something you had said in the middle of your lecture, and I think a strand of which you uh, had expanded upon in your answer to my colleague over there. You talked about how very often a dominant narrative can be challenged by an emergent narrative, right? And I think the example you use is the narrative around the Constitution, but more specifically around former President Mandela and perhaps the contestation around his place in our history. And I wonder, um, Judge, what are the conditions within which dominant narratives can be challenged, can be contested? And do you think that it is the elapse of time? Do you think, I think as you had uh, made mention to, it is um, the exuberance of youth, my cohort perhaps, uh, who challenged these narratives? And is that an urgent question? Is that a needed uh, uh, condition? I think all of those. I think all of those are um, are elements that that might lead to the questioning of narratives. But it doesn't have to be any of those. I mean, the mere fact that a dominant narrative exists means that there's a less dominant, right? Um, and so even if there hasn't been a passage of time, my sense is, my guess is, I don't know, but my sense is that even in 1994, 1996, the Constitution was adopted, not 94, right? So even in 1996, I'm sure there were those that thought this is not a good Constitution, that this Constitution is selling us out, right? So no passage of time. I am sure that perhaps in those days, even those that could not be accused of having the exuberance of youth because of age, might have questioned. So yes, those things are, um, are certainly um, relevant elements, but I don't think they have to be there. Uh, it's not necessary for any, it's, it's just necessary for there to be a different view for a narrative to be questioned. Now, whether or not the challenge of the dominant narrative will be successful, that's a different matter. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what conditions um, need to exist, but I guess constant communication, constant conversation, constant exchanges uh, could lead to the successful challenge of a dominant um, narrative. Judge Clady, hello. Um, um, thank you so much. I learned so much uh, from this. I guess I have a question uh, on a similar line to some of the points that have been brought up about power. Uh, and, and challenging kind of dominant narratives. Um, and I wonder um, about the stakes. About the? The stakes. stakes. So the stakes in, in having this uh, kind of marketplace of ideas, like, uh, at, 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 and I think so, I, mean, I, I guess I would like to ask, you know, what are the stakes, and, and, and especially when we're talking about things like genocide, crimes against humanity, et cetera, et cetera, aggression, um, what are the stakes, given that narratives kind of can take quite a lot of time to shift? Um, and I think related to that, how do we think about this in the context where there's so much silencing uh, of so many uh, who speak against hegemonic narratives and how, um, how equal is this marketplace of ideas, I guess, would be the question. Thank you so much. I mean, to answer your question very briefly, Kelly Jo, um, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, to, to answer that question very briefly, um, I mean, the stakes are very high. The stakes are, I think, really about the future of humanity. I mean, there's a, there's a little line I kept throwing in, in the statement about how narratives are important for creation of a better world. I mean, think about the, the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Um, I actually thought that was a wonderful opportunity for, for the entrenchment of the, um, of the narrative that I would like to be dominant, namely that force sh 
should not be allowed except in very limited instances. And so, for example, that first UN General Assembly resolution that was adopted, um, which South Africa, I think, abstained from, I think. I was on a Cape radio station, um, incidentally, and I was asked whether or not I agreed with the abstention. I said, well, I, you know, I don't know what the reasons that the, South Africa, um, that the South African government put forward, but if I was in New York, um, I would have said, well, we can support this resolution on the understanding that we include some language here that essentially constrains force, not only in respect of this conflict, but going forward, right? And so the stakes are very high. That so that resolution didn't do that, which means that the debates about when force may be used is open. That conflict and the debate, and because the world was united, sort of, created the opportunity, actually, to stop the debate, right? Have a really strong resolution that says we're against force. The only exceptions that we recognize are self-defense, very narrowly circumscribed and understood, and authorization by the Security Council. You could have done it. So, so the stakes are very high, um, I think. And so it's precisely why I think that, that these debates and so the discussion about, well, I don't want to sign off on a statement which just focuses on one situation um, without actually dealing with the core problem. And the core problem is the prohibition on the use of force is in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, so yeah, I think the stakes are very high. At least in most instances, the stakes are very high. I mean, they might not be high in all instances. Um, so, but again, if you think back to the Bashir situation, most people don't, un don't know that I actually don't like immunity, even though I was saying he has immunity. But, yes, you know, of course, because we've had conversations about this. But these debates, these discussions in which you know, I was called the, the protector of, for me, created an opportunity for us to say, you know, if you really want to get this guy so much, let's talk about doing away with immunity, right? But it can't be just for one guy or one conflict. It has to be widespread, right? And so, yeah, I think that, the, that the, for me, the stakes are very high. Um, they're about the future of our planet. They're about the, the, the future of our humanity. Uh, great. Okay, thank you. That was very insightful. I think my question overlaps a bit with his question, Razuka, on the other side. So given your insights on narrative, how can one effectively challenge a dominant narrative using a revered narrative, and what role does factual truth play in the success of this challenge? Well, I should start off by saying I really don't have that many insights on narrative as I tried to explain at the beginning that I, you know, um, you might actually, um, uh, actually have more expertise in. How does one challenge narratives? By expressing yourself and, I mean, expressing yourself against the narrative if you don't believe in it, if you don't accept it. That's how we challenge narratives. We, we try to convince um, and sometimes when the views that we want to express are unpopular, we might want to sort of hold back a little bit. So what's interesting is the tyranny of narrative, in fact, this is a question that I thought I would get, um, is never legislated, right? So, so I spoke about your freedom of expression being limited, but it's not really limited because there's no law that prevents me from saying the things that I've said. What prevents is vitriol that comes from outside, you know, from others. So just withstand it, right? <laughs> withstand it. Allow yourself to be unpopular. Allow yourself to be unpopular. That's, I think, the answer to that question. Thank you very much. Before you go, just I, 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 I don't know what this is, but it's called a UCT. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Thank you very, very much, um, and really, really appreciate um, the lecture this evening, as well as really the time that you've invested in coming back here. So we can actually say, as the VC pointed out, that you are truly the son of the soil. <laughs> I 
I think this brings us to the end of the lecture. I know that we have gone much longer than we thought we would, um, and but I really think he's given us quite a lot to, to, to think about tonight. And in particular, I think for us is what kind of um, environment within our own institution we actually create for narratives to flourish, to be engaged in what you call this um, market of ideas. You know, it's quite interesting that we always spoken about TB Devi in many ways as the poster child for academic freedom, but we probably have never looked at some of the characters that underlie his own approach to life. Um, I was looking at a um, memorial um, um, given for him on the 23rd of December, 1955. It was by the vice chancellor of his alma mater, um, Liverpool University. Uh, say James Mountford, and he pointed out something about uh, T.B. Devi by pointing out that he had an all-pervading friendliness, a heart uh, sympathetically attuned to his fellow men, and a sensitive understanding of their hopes and fears, their doubts and aspirations. There is a context in which academic freedom can be allowed to flourish. And unless we cultivate that which was for him, what made him a champion of academic freedom, which means although he disagreed with people and he had different views, that predisposition which he had to his fellow men was still what allowed him to be a champion and a poster child for what we hold very dearly in Cape Town. I just want us to remind us as we go. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening.